We live on the cutting edge of physics, material science, engineering, and nanotechnology. Because at Lockheed Martin, we're engineering a better tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. It's quite the introduction. It's great to be here today and to talk to all of you. I really appreciate the opportunity to give these kind of talks and um, just to let you know what we're doing, what we're doing at NASA, what we're doing in science to make sure that everybody knows why we're doing it and why it's important. So we'll get started with a little bit of background here. So this is a picture, probably any, anyone guess where this was taken from? Yell it out, yeah, from the International Space Station. Yeah, from space. And so this picture is special to me because this is actually my hometown, Caribou, Maine. So northeasternmost city in the United States, and that's where I grew up. And when I was about five years old, my mom told me I started saying I wanted to be an astronaut. Maybe some of you have been saying that for a long time too, and I never stopped saying it since then. So I wanted to tell you just a little bit today about my path and getting where I am now because it's really difficult for me to believe still, you know, some mornings I wake up thinking, could this really have happened? Could this childhood dream really have happened? So it sounds kind of cheesy sometimes to say, but it's, it's true, dreams can really come true. So. Ever since the time I was young, I started immersing myself in trying to learn more about NASA, to take advantage of all these opportunities. NASA actually has a great outreach program. Um, there's a NASA booth here at the, uh, at the event and symposium the next few days. So if you have more questions and want to find out about more resources, educational resources, outreach activities, programs you can be involved in, there are a lot out there. So that's one of the first things I started doing. I, was, I went to a space camp at Purdue University when I was a kid, and then when I was in college, I got to do one of the coolest things um, in my life at that point, and that was to ride on the, what we call the Vomit Comet, so NASA's aircraft that flies in these parabolic patterns in order to achieve brief periods of weightlessness. So that's a, a picture of this from my alumni magazine. But at the same time that I was really had this interest in NASA and spaceflight, I also had a really, really big interest interest in living things, in nature and in the world around me, and in particular in biology. So I was really interested in science, but biology was my favorite class, and so I thought, you know, maybe this isn't the most traditional path. I'm not, I'm, maybe I don't want to be an engineer. Um, like, like a lot of people think all of the astronauts are engineers or military pilots. I have this big interest in biology, so I'm going to pursue that at the same time too. So I did. And I was really particularly fascinated by animals that can do amazing things. You know, there are species of animals that can dive down hundreds and hundreds of meters below the ocean surface. There are animals, birds that migrate almost around the entire planet. And I was really interested in looking at these animals and these incredible, this diversity of behaviors in the animal kingdom and trying to think, well, how can they do it? We can't do it as humans. We're, we're breath hold divers just like an emperor penguin is or an elephant seal, but how come I can't hold my breath for two hours? So I was really interested in the physiology that allows these types of behaviors to happen. So what is unique about their body that allows them to do these amazing things? So this picture, actually I probably just said it, didn't I? But everybody knows what this animal is, right? An emperor penguin, yeah, they've become quite, quite popularized. And this animal is special to me because they're the best diver of any other bird. So these divers can hold their breath for almost 30 minutes. So think about it, the entire time I'm going to be standing up here if you were holding your breath the whole time. Don't try it because you probably will pass out, but these guys can do it. And they're down there swimming along, you know. Of course, people really know a lot about their amazing behavior above the ice. You know, they can they they're um, incubating their eggs during this harsh Antarctic winter. But for me, it's that diving ability that was really fascinating. How are these birds able to go down here beneath the surface of the ice in this case and hold their breath and swim around, sometimes being down there for half an hour? What is unique about their physiology that allows them to do that? And so that is what I was doing for my scientific research. We would actually go to the Antarctic, we would set up a camp and we would live and work there on the ice. And we would put these little backpack recorders on the animals so that we could directly measure these different parameters about their physiology. So how, what's their heart rate look like? How quickly is their heart beating when they're diving? What is the level of oxygen? How quickly do they use oxygen when they're diving? And those kind of questions. 
And to fit with the title of my talk here, I was fortunate enough to get to dive down there too, to dive under the ice, to observe the penguins, to clean off the windows of an observation chamber so other people could go down without having to dive. And, uh, and that was such an amazing opportunity to be able to dive beneath, beneath the ice because that's where all the life is in the Antarctic. So I worked with emperor penguins and then I also worked with this species. Anybody know what animal this is here? Anybody know what kind of seal it is? An elephant seal, yeah. So an elephant seal is just as cool as an emperor penguin, but now it's not a bird. Now we're talking about a mammal. And they're one of the best divers in the mammalian world, definitely among any seal species. They can hold their breath. Who wants to take a guess? A penguin, 30 minutes. How about this seal? What do you think? One hour. There's one guess. Anybody have another guess? Two, hour, two hours is right, two hours on a single breath. And remember, they're mammals just like us. They need oxygen to survive. They need to be able to breathe to survive, but they can hold their breath for two hours to dive, to forage, to catch fish, because they rely on diving in the oceans for their food. They need to dive to survive, and that has enabled them to become very, very good divers. So like the penguins, we would put, we would, we, whoops, we would be out in the field and we would put these different, um, recorders on the animals to measure those different aspects of their physiology. This is a little GPS antenna so that we can follow the animal as it's released. And so that's the kind of, those are the kind of questions that really excited me. I loved being out in the wild, working with the animals, um, working in this environment where you had to shovel snow all day, sometimes in the Antarctic, for example, before even doing science. So it was that combination of using my brain and also you know, using some physical exertion that made me the happiest. After my work with these diving animals, I then found out about another extreme animal, the bar-headed goose. This species of goose actually flies over the tallest mountains on the planet, the Himalayas, of course. So at that altitude, you know, there's still air, there's still oxygen, but there isn't as much oxygen. There's only about a half or a third of the amount that we have down here on the ground. So they're not holding their breath like a diving penguin or seal, but again, they're in this very challenging environment, not very much oxygen, and they need a lot of oxygen to fly. So this project was one of the hardest things I ever did. We decided to actually raise these birds from the time that they were babies. So these geese actually thought that I was their mother. I was the first thing that they saw when they hatched out of the egg, and so they really thought that I was their parent, and they would follow me around, and they would cuddle with me, and like pile up on all top of me. It was a really amazing experience to have this bond with an, with an animal like that. The goal was we wanted them to be comfortable with me and with my team so that we could fly them in a wind tunnel. Then we could have a really controlled environment flying in a wind tunnel, as you might imagine for a bird. It's kind of like walking on a treadmill for you. So we had this nice controlled environment where we could measure these different aspects of their physiology again, like we did with the diving animals. So the goal was to fly them in the wind tunnel. Unfortunately, when we were ready to start experiments, the wind tunnel was broken, so we got to spend some time outside. But this was an amazing experiment because, um, experience because I would be riding up and down the road on this scooter, and the bird would be flying next to me, flapping along, sometimes so close to me that their wing would be brushing my arm with their wingtip. And anyway, I'd be looking in the eye of this flying bird. So it was a really interesting experience. And then after that, we finally were successful in flying them in the wind tunnel, and we actually trained them to wear masks as well so that we could measure the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. We could see how much oxygen they're using. We could measure how hard they were working, and we could also change the amount of oxygen that they were breathing so we could simulate that sort of high altitude. Um, we could say, okay, we're going to only give them half the amount of oxygen like it would be an altitude halfway up to the Himalayas. And so, we actually were successful in doing that. And I'm gonna show you a little video here. Here's one of my babies. This is my baby goose and I'm up here kind of encouraging it along. You can see the little mask. It's got another one of those little backpack recorders like the diving animals did. And so we were successful in training these geese to fly in a wind tunnel. And so these are the kind of questions and, um, and and this was really the area of research that I was most interested in. So here I am, not really pursuing anything to do with space right now, right? Like I'm still interested in that. I'd done a lot of other NASA things, but, but I was really following what I was passionate about, and that was biology and doing these experiments. And so I felt incredibly lucky because here I am, you know, I knew, just like all of you know, 
you know, I'd love to be an astronaut, but there's a really small chance of that happening. Even if I work really hard, it still takes a lot of luck and not everybody gets a chance to do it. So I felt really, really lucky that I had this whole other career that I loved, that I enjoyed so much working in the outdoors, working with these animals. Um, but then I found out that NASA was doing a selection. And so I thought, well, you know, I, I have to apply. This is my childhood dream. And so in 2013, that dream came true. And interestingly, it, I had actually applied before. So this is another one of those life lessons about working hard and never quitting, right? Because in 2009, I interviewed to become an astronaut. I made it all the way to the final round. I went to Houston. I had the interview. Everything went really well. But then they called me and they said, hey, great job, but we're only selecting nine people and you're not one of them. It didn't work out for you this time, but try again. Um, so instead of giving up, I did, you know, I went back to my research and I was working with the geese and I was doing all those amazing experiments. And then the chance came to apply again. And when I interviewed that time, I thought, it's going to be just like last time. It'll be a great opportunity to go to NASA again and see all these people. But, you know, it's just such a small chance. But it's OK. There are so many amazing people that deserve this job. But this time, the news was a little bit different. And this was the announcement that came out showing me and my seven classmates. And that, for me, was really the dream come true. You know, this iconic image that we think of with astronauts with this blue flight suit that I'm wearing. That, to me, was what I'd thought about my whole life. And so finally getting this official picture taken was was a pretty big deal. It's kind of funny walking around like this, you know, in the streets of DC, and people aren't really sure if you're dressed up for some kind of play or something. But, but so now I wanted to switch gears a little bit. And after showing you, you know, some of my earlier career path, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our training at NASA. So as mentioned in the introduction, I started in 2013 with my fellow classmates in this astronaut candidate training period. And in order to graduate from the program and become real astronauts and get assigned a mission in space, we had to demonstrate that we could do all of these things really well. Now, I'm going to show you some examples, some pictures, just to walk you through that a little bit. But the really cool thing about this job is that you do something different every day. You know, you're not just stuck behind a computer all day doing the same thing. Not that that's a bad thing, if that's what you're interested in. But I really like doing different things all the time. So one day you might be flying a plane. You know, one day, you know, I'll show you some pictures here of, of all the different things we do. So one of the big areas is flight training. This is the NASA T-38, and we use this as a great training environment because how do you train for space? You know, you can't, we don't have microgravity. We don't have the spaceflight environment that we can actually use to train in on, down here on Earth. So we have to do a lot of simulations where we, we practice different things. But this is a, this is a real training platform. It's a, a, we actually have to work together as a team. We have to communicate. We have to fly the airplane. It's a risky situation that can have some in, important consequences if we make a mistake. So it's a great training plat platform for space flight. And I was always interested in airplanes. I wanted to fly airplanes from the time I was a kid. And I didn't think I'd ever get to fly a jet because, you know, most people, you have to join the military if you're going to fly a jet. So before I became an astronaut, about 15 years ago, I decided that I wanted to take flying lessons because there's something I wanted to do, so why not? So I used to fly small airplanes like this Cessna here. I never thought I'd get the chance to fly in the T-38, but that's almost like another dream in a dream that came true. So in the beginning of our training period, those of us that didn't have military aviation experience got to go to the Navy Pensacola base and first fly this. It's called the T-6. So the T in military aircraft names stands for trainer. So these are trainer aircraft that the military uses for their pilots. So we went there and we learned a lot about flying this airplane to better prepare us for coming back to NASA and flying in the T-38 where things are happening really quickly. You're in an ejection seat. You have a helmet and an oxygen mask, so you need to be thinking and doing a lot of things at the same time. So sometimes you can even, you know, get the actual T-38 selfie here, but don't worry, I wasn't texting and flying. The person in the front seat was flying when I took this picture, but people seem to really like it. <laughs> so that's the first thing that we did was the flight training. Then we also have International Space Station Systems. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the space station. That is our main platform right now for, for human space missions with NASA. And the International Space Station, does anybody, anybody know anything about it? Has anybody seen it pass overhead maybe? There's a great app called ISS Spotter that you can download on your phones. So you can actually predict when the space station is going to pass over. And you can see this incredibly bright object passing over the sky. You can wave to the astronauts up there. Hopefully in a few years you can think about me when I'm up there and you can wave to me. So the International Space Station has been up here in orbit around the Earth 
for about 16 years now, we've had a continuous human presence on the space station. We have six astronauts at a time up there right now. We live, we work, we do lots of scientific experiments, we do spacewalks, we maintain the equipment, we fix things when they break. It's about the size of a football field end to end. So you can see the big solar arrays. Here you have the main truss support system and these cylindrical volumes, those, that's where we live and work inside the space station. So it's really important for us to understand how all those different systems work because when we're up there, we're gonna to have to operate the equipment, we're gonna to have to fix things. If our toilet breaks or if we have a problem with our electrical system, we can't call an electrician or a plumber like you can at home. We need to be trained in all of these different areas so that we can do it. And that's what some of my classmates are doing right here. They're learning how to fix the toilet. They're learning about all the other systems on the space station. This is a, the cupola. This is where you see a lot of the really great pictures from the space station taken. You can take the pictures through, uh, through those windows right here. So then we have robotics. The space station, on the space station we have the ro this robotic arm that was really important when we were building the space station. Because if you think about it, you know, we actually built this kind of like a Tinker Toy set or like a Lego set. You know, one module will launch at a time and then another one would launch later and then we would connect them together and we would use this robotic arm to help us move things around and then we'd also use spacewalks to help us build the station. Now you actually fly this robotic arm from inside the space station. So you have these controllers, it's kind of like playing a video game. You have a rotational controller and a, a translational controller and you're flying this arm around and you have to be really careful. It takes a lot of training because you could actually fly the arm into the space station and damage the space station or, you know, dam or hurt an astronaut. Sometimes the astronauts are riding around on the end of the arm. So that's another big part of our training. Then we had Russian language training. How many of you guys speak another language? All right, that's great, that's great. That's a really important skill. It's an international space station like we talked about. So we're up there with our partners, the Russian cosmonauts, the European astronauts, the Japanese astronauts, and the Canadian astronauts. We're all up there working together. It's an international project, so we all speak both English and Russian up there. And lastly, we have our spacewalk training, everybody's favorite part, right? I mean, that's the iconic image that you think about when you think about an astronaut. And that was really a dream come true for me to get into the spacesuit. And we train for that. Now, of course, we don't have microgravity. We have gravity here on the Earth. Every, and so how do we train for this in the spacesuit? Because in the spacesuit, you weigh like 400 pounds. So you can't just walk around in space. Obviously, it doesn't matter how much you weigh. You can move around quite easily. So we train in the neutral buoyancy lab here at NASA. This is this giant pool. 40 feet deep, 100 feet wide, 200 feet long. And you see in here, we have a whole mock-up of the space station, a one-to-one -one model under the surface of the water there so that we can learn how to practice doing spacewalks. You can see this is what the actual space station looks like. Here's the whole, the same section underwater so we can practice doing the spacewalk and learn how to operate in the suit before we get up there. So this was an amazing thing, the first time getting in the suit. You have all these people getting you ready. You can see she's adjusting my microphones here and I've got my little communications cap on so I can hear. And then we're all ready, the helmet's on, and you get lowered down into the water, and you have all your tools on you, and you can go about learning how to use the spacesuit. And so after we sort of mastered all those five things, really happy to say that uh, my five classmates and I graduated. We, we still do a lot of other training as well. This is a picture in Maine. We do things, you know, just like your parents tell you, learning how to play nicely with others is a really important skill. Because can you imagine going up there on the space station in this small, isolated environment with five people and maybe they're not the nicest people in the world, maybe they don't share with you, maybe they're not good team players. So these are all really important skills that we learn. Um, this is sur survival skills in the wilderness. We learn planetary science skills for doing science. Um, here's another microgravity flight from the, uh, the vomit comet that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is another really important of our training is of course physical fitness. When you go up there in space, you need to work out a lot because otherwise our muscle mass will, will lose muscle mass, will lose density in our bones, and we won't really be able to maintain our health because on Earth, we're really dependent on gravity helping out with those things. So exercise is another huge important part, and we have amazing equipment up there on the space station in order to facilitate that. 
This is more of that teamwork stuff that I mentioned. We actually got to go on this 10 day backpacking trip in Wyoming, which was beautiful. Um, and for me, that's like a vacation. I love camping and hiking, so this was great. But it's really another important um, opportunity for us to practice those skills, taking care of yourself, taking care of your team, teamwork, using all people's strengths to really accomplish a common goal. And so those are really important things that you're learning in the classroom now that carry all the way out into being an astronaut and at NASA. And as I mentioned, all eight of us did actually graduate. So we, this is a picture from our, our ceremony here, and now we are called real astronauts. So what do we do now? We still maintain proficiency in all of those areas to make sure we don't forget how to do all those important things, but we're also assigned jobs within the office and around NASA. My job right now is called the CAPCOM, that's the capsule communicator. So that's the position in the mission control center that actually speaks to the astronauts while they're up there. So this is a picture of me in the control center. You have your flight director over here who's in charge of things. You have different flight controllers that represent all the different systems in the space station. And then I'm the lucky person that actually gets to talk to them if they have questions, to answer their questions, to give them a little bit more background to make sure that they're safe and happy and doing well up there. So various other pictures here. We also do some science training for me as a biologist. Not that difficult, not that unfamiliar to be working in a lab, but remember that some people have incredibly different backgrounds, maybe military pilots that aren't that familiar with it. And when we go to the space station, we need to operate all these different kinds of experiments, so it's important for us to have some of that background training. This is a picture from some, a leadership course at a, an Air Force base where we had, to, we had to do these sort of like obstacle courses, which was another great opportunity to use both our minds to figure out the problem, but then also use our physical fitness in order to accomplish the task at hand. And um, here's another training opportunity I had recently. We call it field maintenance training. I actually spent two weeks with the mechanics that repair our T-38 jets. So I was underneath the jet, fixing things all day long, you know, in the electronics lab, soldering things, building hydraulic components. Really important skills for us as astronauts because like I mentioned, I can't call a plumber to fix a toilet. I need to be able to have those skills and that sort of fix it know-how myself. So this was a great opportunity to, to practice some of that. So I really wanted to emphasize you guys and students and starting to think about what you want to do with your lives. You know, there are a lot of different ways to making your dreams come true. And your dreams might not be the same thing that I did, that, that, that mine are. The important thing is to identify, like you just heard in the previous talk, what you're good at, what you're interested in, what you're passionate about. Not just what people tell you you should be doing, but what you want to do, what you excel at. And the interesting thing is that there are lots of different ways to make those things come true. So I just wanted to show you some examples from the other people in my class because there are a lot they're very, very diverse. They're not like me at all. I'm the only biologist in the class. You have my friend Anne here, my classmate. She's a, she was an Army test pilot, so she flew these helicopters in the Army. We have Nick. He was an Air Force flight test engineer, so he was the guy that sat in the back seat of the jet and did all the really complicated technical stuff while the other guy flew the airplane. Here we have Victor. He's a test pilot in the Navy. He flew F-18 Hornets before being an astronaut. This is my friend Christina. She's an electrical engineer. She spent a lot of time in remote field sites. She went to the Antarctic like I did, and she um, did some space science instrumentation as well, so building satellites and that kind of thing. This is Josh. He was also a test pilot with the Navy. And then this is Drew. He was an Army physician. And then here's Nicole. Here's a, she's a test pilot with a Marine. She also flew the F-18 Hornet like Victor. So you can see we all have very, very different backgrounds. The one thing that we have in common, we all have a background in the STEM field. Science, technology, engineering, math, critically important to everything that we do today, but lots of different ways to skin that cat. You know, follow what you're interested in, what you're passionate about, and what, you are, what you're good at. And the other thing to remember is to think a little bit bigger, expand your view a little bit, broaden your perspective. So, you know, sometimes it's easy to get caught in, in the little everyday things about life at home, in your school, what you're going to wear the next day, what you got on your history test, a fight you might be having with a friend. But you need to try to broaden that perspective, to take a step back. And let's, if you think about home, for example, you might think about 
your house or your backyard, but think about it from a little bit of a bigger perspective. Here's a picture of your home for all of you from the local DC area. This is a picture of your home from the space station. So start thinking, take a step back, and start picturing things from a little bit of a broader perspective. We could think about home in terms of the entire planet, right? This is home to all of us, to everybody, to every human being. Anybody know where this picture was taken? Yeah, from the surface of the moon. And this was really important because for you guys, you grew up seeing pictures of the Earth from outside of Earth because we've been going to space for all of you kids for all of your lives. But for some of your parents and your grandparents, we hadn't left the surface of, of the Earth before when they were growing up. And so when the Apollo astronauts, Bill Anders, took this picture from the surface of the moon, it was an incredible revelation, really. It was really very important in establishing the environmental movement when people saw for the first time this fragile blue planet that we really needed to take care of. Anybody know where this picture was taken from? Yeah, this was taken by the Curiosity rover in 2014. So, you know, we haven't had humans on Mars yet, but we have had rovers there. This picture was taken from Curiosity, and th that is what the Earth looks like from Mars. So there's your home back there, and it really is interesting to kind of think in that kind of perspective. You know, can you see your house or your backyard, or would you even be thinking about your history exam from this perspective? There's a whole solar system, there's a whole universe out there to keep in mind. So I'm just gonna end with playing a little bit of a video. I can't show you pictures of being in space yet because I haven't been there, but hopefully in a few years I'll get to go to the space station. And I'm just gonna show you a video to, to put some of those, some of that perspective and this home idea of home um, from a different vantage point and a little bit about what life on the space station's like. So there's the space station. You get some incredible aurora. Here's one of our commercial vehicles visiting, and this is the docking of the Soyuz. So a new crew coming to the space station from the Soyuz. 93 million miles from the sun. People get ready, get ready. Cause here it comes, it's a light, a beautiful light. Over the horizon in the Chris Cassidy and Robonaut. Oh my, my, how beautiful. Oh my beautiful mother she told me There's Karen Nyberg washing her hair in space. There's one of the, the treadmill that we have for exercising up there. Some scientific experiments, you'll see a bunch of those. Those are the solar panels that are reflecting all that light that you can see when the space station passes over. Those are the sleeping quarters, so everybody has their own private little sleeping space. It's really your only personal space on the space station. 240,000 miles from the moon We've come a long way to belong here To share this view of the night A glorious night Over the horizon is another bright sky oh, my, my, All of those signs say home in a different language Because oh, we've got Russian cosmonauts up there We have a Japanese astronaut up there That's the one in the middle Those are some previous crews They're not up there right now there's that good view from the cupola. That says home in German. A German astronaut that was up there recently. That's the Soyuz, so that's, that's how we're getting to and from the space station right now with our Russian colleague. And that's how the Soyuz lands in the middle of nowhere. The, the landing softened with the slowdown for the parachutes, and then some rockets fire so you have a softer landing. So that's astronaut Mike Hopkins on the space station watching his son's hockey game. He didn't want to miss out. When you land in the Soyuz, the Russian Thanks, ground Alex. teams... Thanks for getting me home. 
So the helicopters land and all these vehicles come in to pick you up and to pull you out of the capsule. That's how we're launching the space station right now. So that's it.